everyone, and welcome to The Darkest Hour. I'm your host, Amanda Jane. I always look forward to Fridays, to bringing you the spooky. This Friday, however, is a bit extra special, because we've got a very special guest. Friends, I'm happy to introduce, if you don't know him already, Booze and Booze. That's B-O-O-Z-E and Booze, like Boo. His story choice is always on point. His voice, I'm absolutely a fan. I think you will be too. I've linked his channel in the description. I hope you'll check him out and subscribe for great content. We've put together some good ones for tonight's show. So, let's get started, shall we? The hood of my car is completely engulfed in flames. It's rush hour in East LA, and the people could give a fuck less about the spectacle taking place next to them. They're all too busy mentally preparing for their day ahead. Distracted enough to ignore the man pushing a fireball down the road. Hi, my name is Amir. I bet you're wondering how I got there. Well... I'm pretty sure my car is, was, haunted. It was also cheap, so no, I'm absolutely not throwing that out as a suspected reason why I no longer have my means of transportation. But up until the spontaneous explosion of my engine, none of the issues have been mechanical, just unsettling. The car was a 2011 Toyota Yaris hatchback. I'd purchased it used from the owner on Craigslist. I even checked the car's history. No accidents, not one scratch. A month goes by, and even with the music off, I still hear talking in the car. A couple times I've looked in my rearview mirror, and only for an instant will I make eye contact with someone in the back seat. Every time, I scream and almost crash. Of course, during the first month, I attempted to gaslight myself, creating absurd excuses in my head as to why I was experiencing these terrors. Black shadow mass in the back seat. It could have been the light hitting my eyes at just the right angle in the mirror, and the whispers they could easily be attributed to the friction of slightly low tires. But then one afternoon, while driving home from work, a cop pulls me over. I'm already paranoid that he'll smell the weed, but this interaction went in a direction I didn't expect. When the cop asks for my license and registration, he leans into my window and says, Where'd your buddy go? In my paranoid brain, I think he's making a Mary Jane reference or something. But thankfully, before I have an opportunity to act on my assumption and incriminate myself, I stuttered out, Buddy, sir? The cop still has his head looking into my back seat, and then he quickly recoils out to scan the desolate road. His attention focuses back on me, and this time his delivery clearly spoken with aggravation. He tells me that when he lit up the car and pulled us over... He clearly saw two occupants in the car. With my hands firmly gripping the steering wheel, I try to explain that I'm the only one here. The officer is having none of it. My words fall upon deaf ears as he takes another step back, removing his gun from the holster and telling me to get out of the car. I've never been a big anarchist in my youth. My style and music taste is rather bland. And physically, I'll never be the biggest man in a social situation. So, when Mr. Policeman pointed his gun at me, I listened. He searches me, cuffs me, then puts me in the back of his car, before turning around and searching under and around my car for the second occupant. 
he obviously never found one. He was sure he'd seen someone in my car, but was equally as sure that he hadn't seen anyone get away. He'd only pulled me over to discuss my tabs, not really an arrestable offense, so I was released. There was something about his entire demeanor after he'd thoroughly investigated my car and its surroundings. Clearly, he was spooked. Getting back into my car after that felt different, to say the least. Was I relieved that someone else witnessed the strangeness? Only slightly. Sure, I'm not crazy, but I still had to drive the car. So, after that event, but before my car was engulfed in flames on the highway, there's one other occurrence that solidified my unease. It's another one I can't really explain. This happened at one of the most inopportune times imaginable. That seems to be a trend in my life, but anyway, I was on a date. The date was going well. Actually, screw that, it was going great. Like, we're hitting it off, chemistry for sure. We met up at this outdoor movie event put on by the city where my date lived. Close to my own, but a bit bigger. It wasn't fancy. I mean, the movie playing was Scooby-Doo, so our expectations were that level. After that good time, we decided to walk around the park with the brilliant idea of going to catch the sunset with some ice cream. This is where my date trusts me enough to get into my car. And how do I repay her? Well, I open the door for her, and as she gets in, I see her face change dramatically. She's instantly turned off, and I'm instantly insecure. Then, I smell it. My car smells like an ashtray, like my grandmother's old trailer, heavy and thick, it was like actual smoke should have accompanied the smell, but there was none. My date and I are still sort of connected since I was holding her hand as I got her into the car. In a total knee-jerk reaction, I pulled her back out of the car, apologizing profusely. She's confused, saying she didn't realize I was a smoker. She's also apologizing for her reaction. I explain that I'm not a smoker, and she gives me a look of disappointment, saying, I could handle if you were a smoker. I mean, I'd probably make you quit, but lying? That's just stupid. And without another word, she was walking back to where I'd originally met her. Obviously, I don't smoke cigarettes. And before you say that it was probably weed, it wasn't. If you've ever smoked weed, or smelled cigarettes, you know the difference. And this was clearly tobacco smoke. That smell, it lasted for three days. It made me physically sick, and I almost considered selling the car at that point, for real. And that brings us to the highway fire. Normal commute for me is several hours in the car, at least one in awful traffic. What gets me through all of this is the radio. I'm in between songs listening to some banter on K-Rock when I catch a glimpse of this shadow in the back seat. I do my normal, get scared, and almost wreck my car, and then I'm incredibly frustrated, almost punching at my steering wheel, but holding back. My radio then cuts out, just going into no-signal mode. A loud, intense static fills my car, far louder than the music or discussion that was happening prior. I'm driving like an asshole now, but for whatever reason, nothing I do to the radio makes a difference. So I give up, and then it stops. I don't even want to be in the car at this point, but what choice do I have? I don't bother trying to turn the radio back on. I decide I'll drive in silence. Of course, that's interrupted by the faint sound of talking. Familiar, but distressing, nonetheless. As I'm looking forward, I see from the top of my vision, the rearview mirror starts to tilt ever so slightly. I look at it. 
no shadow there, but I swear on everything. I felt something in that car. It felt like it was sitting right next to me, and it looked as though it was moving the mirror towards itself. I move my gaze slightly, and sure enough, a black mass is idling in the passenger seat. This all happened in a matter of seconds, all while I calmly try merging towards the far lane to exit. It wasn't my exit, but I just had that horrible feeling about being on the road, being in this car. I felt as though I was losing control of the car itself. I wish so badly I could explain what that felt like, accurately anyway, but I'll try. It felt like even though I wanted to slow down, I was finding myself accelerating. I wanted to keep my eyes on the road, but this black mass was pulling all of my attention, all of my focus. My hands on the steering wheel were burning. Instead of pulling back or protecting them in some way, I dug them in, creating an unnecessarily strong grip. Painful yet, I couldn't stop. Before I even make it over two lanes, I smell smoke. It smells like burning plastic. And immediately after, I see the entire hood of my car engulfed in flames. I somehow manage to make it over another two lanes without hitting anyone. As I reach the shoulder, it feels like the steering wheel is going to burn through my hands. Straight panicking, this car is going to lock me inside of it, burning me alive. I open the driver's side door, putting one foot out as I slow to a stop. Finally, I throw it in park, barely have enough time to grab my phone as another roar of flames bursts through the interior of my car. I waited close to an hour, all while watching my car burn. Ironically, I was now the traffic I despise so much, but I thought to myself, no way has anyone ever had such an excuse to cause traffic. This quite literally wasn't my fault. Yet here I was. Well, here I am. No car, working with a rental. No future car plans in sight, given that I bought the car so cheap and not from a dealership. My quote from the insurance I already can't afford is about enough to cover a down payment for a car I could never afford. But at least I'm alive. I've tried to reach out to the guy who sold me the car, but I can't get any sort of response from him. He's told me the same thing twice now, so maybe that's why. All the car's history is in the report. Yeah, I don't think so, buddy. But thanks for teaching me that there is such thing as a deal too good to be true. I don't know, man. I think I'm still in shock. I moved into this big old house that my buddy was trying to sell. It had no furniture, and I was just living there temporarily while he was trying to sell it. This place was cold and boring. No internet, no TV, just my instruments for entertainment. Anyway, we always thought the place was haunted. Footsteps heard, things moving. My buddy even claimed he saw a lady walk down the hall one night. But me living there alone really brought out the creepiness. So I would always hear someone walking around and moving things in the kitchen. I would fuck with it like a boss. Sitting in the living room looking out the window. I would play my banjo for a few minutes. And stop until it started moving around. Then I would be creeped out. And start playing again. I would do this cat and mouse game for hours. One night a friend came over and while sitting in the backyard we heard a scream from inside the house. This all while we were discussing the possibility that the place was haunted because the previous owner died in it. After going to bed later that night, I stepped into the hallway and from behind me in the mirror at the end of the hallway, I saw a giant flash of light creep me out. Also, that night I heard footsteps once again. 
My homeowner buddy came over not long after that night. We and some chick all slept in the same bed because we were that scared. We heard shit all night long. Next morning I woke up and one of my socks was on the floor of the bathroom covered in blood. No clue where the blood came from and not to mention I kept all my clothes in the living room in my suitcase. I called my buddy in to come check it out and when he stepped into the bathroom every single towel fell off the towel racks. Yeah, we promptly moved out after that. My partner and I moved back to Seattle in January to the Chinatown International District and we've loved it. But lately... We've been experiencing some weird things in the apartment. The first weird thing to happen was about a month ago. My partner was in the only closet in our studio apartment when he jumped out, startled, eyes as big as dinner plates. Without taking his eyes off the closet, he asked me if I had just said, Help me. I told him I hadn't as I was just sitting at the computer, playing a game. We shook it off and assumed it was nothing. Then, a week ago, I was cooking something for dinner while my partner was showering. Completely distracted, I felt a hand on my ass, so I jokingly batted it away, asking him not to bother me while I was cutting up vegetables. No answer, so I turned around and he was still in the shower. I went and asked him if he was fucking with me, to which he said he wasn't. Fast forward to last night and to just now. Last night I was laying in bed, having a hard time getting to sleep, and out of the corner of my eye, I see a head and shoulders raised from the foot of the bed. I do a quick double take, but... My second look, the figure is gone. And literally, about ten minutes ago, I'm back in bed, and I see the shadow of a man walk by the corner of my bed into the kitchen. I'm freaked out. All doors and windows are locked. I checked the two rooms in the studio, bathroom, laundry room, and there's nothing. Not a single sign of someone else in our apartment. I feel very on edge. This is something I experienced shortly after moving out of one of my teenage homes a couple of years ago. When I was around 13 or 14 years old, my great-grandmother used to collect dolls. One of the dolls I took a particular liking to because of how goddamn creepy it looks. She picked up on it and actually gave it to me not too long before she passed away. Fast forward to the story at hand. My two stepbrothers and I were sitting in the living room chatting late at night, around 1am or so. For context, this is a cookie cutter house. So when you walk in, you basically have to choose between going upstairs or downstairs. The living room is directly upstairs from the front door. There is a fireplace on the left-hand wall, but not much else to note since it was an open concept. Adjacent to the wall, there is a railing overlooking the doorway area, and in front of the railing is the couch. There is also a television sitting on the ground opposite the wall to the couch. So during our conversation, we get on the topic of childhood paranormal experiences. Joking around, I went and grabbed the doll from my bedroom and leaned it up against a shelf above the fireplace. I made sure when I put the doll up there that it was leaning securely so as to not slip off. A few things that are now important. The television is on, but just in the no signal screen. And because we were preparing to move, there are boxes and trash bags piled up in front of the fireplace at least three to five feet out. We were all sitting on the couch at the time that this happened. In the middle of a story, my younger stepbrother was talking about an experience he had had in the basement of his childhood home. 
the doll was flung forward from the shelf, landing a few good feet away from the boxes, meaning it flew a good six to eight feet away from the fireplace. At that exact time, the doll made contact with the ground. The television shut itself off and then turned itself back on. We've never had any electrical issues inside that house or with that television. Needless to say, we all just about pissed ourselves. I know people are going to say it's possible that the doll had just fallen. But that doll flew forward off of that shelf, even though it was leaning backwards. And things that fall don't typically fall outwards several feet. Let me know what you guys think about this, and maybe I'll post a picture of the doll. Don't speak ill of the dead. Well, I feel I can because my meeting and interaction with my friend's great uncle happened after he slogged off this mortal coil. A close friend of mine had a long day of chores at one of their farms, and since it was hot and she'd just given birth, I offered to help out so it could go quicker and she didn't have to do the heavy lifting. It was a long, hard day, and as the sun was beginning to make its way down, she smacked her head and then her steering wheel. Holy hell, I forgot I have to feed the dogs up the mountain. She looked very regretful as she said, I gotta go get some dry kibble to give the neighbors, to give the dogs up at my uncle's cabin. I'm sorry you were so nice to come, but I have to do this. I said, let's get some people food too and I'm all yours. So apparently my friend Marie was not kidding as we made our way up the mountain roads, switchbacks going higher and higher. The story was that she was left the property by her great uncle to live on with her husband. Unfortunately, having a preemie baby meant staying within a quick trip's time to the hospital, whereas this mountain was hours from anything. The neighbors fed the animals under the conditions that they were supplied feed, and since it was such a great favor that they were doing, she couldn't afford to be late delivering food. It was almost dark as we approached the neighbor's cabin. All of her uncle's dogs come running out, excited and silly, as only labs can be. The neighbors took the food and suggested Marie go up and check on the house, since they didn't have the keys, and it had been about a month. Another twenty minutes later, we arrive at the terraced property on the side of the mountain. The cabin was gorgeous, and as we entered... There was a vestibule with a picture window and hooks for keys that looked like metal flowers. They were cool. Marie put the keys on the hook and we went exploring. Everything was locked and the sun was setting. We turned on all the lights, tested the pipes for the sinks and the bath, and everything was in order. Finally, I can go home and sleep. We head to the front and the keys are gone. We are equally as baffled, and our tempers are starting to flare. Marie has a baby girl at home and needed to pump her breasts as they were getting swollen and painful. And I was tired and sore as fuck. Once we realized neither of us had them, we tore the place apart. Finally, an hour later, both cranky, we decided to build a fire in the fire pit and spend the night in the car as it was at least dust-free. I walk up an incline and I see a shed. I yell down to ask, what is it for? And she says, firewood. So using my phone flashlight, we had no service anyway. I went up to the incline and looked in the shed. Okay, lots of dried wood. I'm very cautious. I was scared of snakes and whatever critters could be nesting in there. My light hits something that gleams and I jump back, realizing I'd scared myself. I laugh and go further in, and I see that the sparkle was the silver trinket on her fucking keychain. We had never been apart. No way for her to have done this. I run, fall down the incline, jingling her keys, and she's like, Thank freaking God. We jump in the car, and we're headed down the mountain. 
Eventually, we get to where there's service. Her phone rings and her aunt from a few states over, supposedly sensitive to the paranormal, worriedly asks, Are you okay? Oh yeah, we were at the cabin, her aunt says. You know, my dad is pissed at you for not living on the property. It'd be easier if you'd just lived there. So, for what seemed like the 100th time, given her level of frustration, Marie points out that she needs to be near a hospital for a while, before moving out to the middle of nowhere. Aunt insists that dead great-uncle is angry, and we eventually get home. As we get out of the car, Marie said, You know, my great-uncle was a huge, abusive asshole who wanted everything his way. And I looked at her and said, Well, nothing has changed since he died. My idea to look in the shed was born out of boredom and desperation to get some wood. There was no guarantee that we would have built a fire at all, so no, I don't think he was returning the keys. We left it alone until we had one more encounter with him and another set of keys. So the second encounter with the second set of missing keys also involves Marie, and it was when I lived with my boyfriend and family. Back then, it wasn't unusual for friends to stop by on a lark. Marie stopped by one sunny afternoon to have her toddler play with the toddler I was caring for. She mentioned that weird things are happening at her house where she was living since visiting her uncle's place with me. Someone would stomp around the house in what sounded like heavy boots. On occasion, the bathroom light would turn itself on, and in the morning, they heard someone doing their morning routine, going through the motions of brewing coffee. She thought that maybe her dead great-uncle might have followed her home when we finally tore out of his property for the last time but the activity sounded like someone who had probably lived there before, so that was my guess. Then she dropped the bomb. Her great nana, who'd come to help care for the new infant, had heard the noises and remarked it sounded like when her great uncle had lived on the property in the early 80s. He'd gotten into flashy cowboy boots in the 80s and liked to strut around the house. According to great nana, He was also a coffee snob who would only make his special coffee for himself and no one else was allowed to touch it. Okay, it sounds like the douche canoe that I'd been told about. When Marie finally decided to go home, her keys were missing. We went outside and stared at my concrete driveway. There was no place for them to fall but on concrete. We ripped the car apart and went through my kitchen. I've known Marie for 14 years, and she's not the sort to lose things, especially not keys. We watched as my dad drove up the long driveway from the top of the hill where our house sat. He comes into the kitchen and does what he always does. He carries in the first bag of groceries, throws his keys in the catch-all tray, sets down the grocery bag and asks for help bringing in the rest. He got a weird look on his face as he stuck his hand in his pockets and threw what ended up being two sets of keys onto the tray. He was startled and gave me a what-the-fuck face. Yes, they were Marie's keys. And yes, we stood on the porch and watched him drive the half-mile up the driveway from the hill the house sat on and followed him into the house. Nobody could explain it. And I was reasonably sure, for whatever reason, it was her great uncle again. I'm not sure if there was a point to it. Why keys? Neither of us can hazard a guess. Keys had no special meaning where he was concerned, except that he had power over whoever he took them from. And that was the last time we had any problems with missing keys. Incidentally, it was just after that last encounter that they had a spiritualist friend 
send her uncle into what was referred to as the Great Beyond. They did this through some sort of cleansing. I already know some of you are going to be like, that's not scary. Or others with your creepy pasta no sleep tags. This isn't for you then. Anyway, almost 10 years ago when I was still living at home, there was something bothering my little brother. Originally, I thought he was having sleep paralysis, shadow people as a result of that kind of thing. But then I got a glimpse of it myself. And yeah, it was definitely a shadow thing. But it wasn't in his mind. My little brother had been complaining to me, my mom, and anyone else who would listen. There's a shadow in my room, and it won't leave me alone. Coming into my room at night, two or three in the morning. Kid stuff. Well, I was up late one night, probably gaming, but I can't exactly remember. And from the corner of my eye, I see a shadow. It's small, so I assume my little brother is getting up... A piece of me thinks maybe it's the shadow he's seeing, so I go check it out for myself. The moment I enter his doorway, I see a shadow the size of my little brother standing over his bed, staring at him. My little brother is fully awake, laying there terrified and saying nothing. I sort of shout at the thing while I rush towards it, and as I do, it completely disappears. Poof. Gone. What the fuck was it? I don't know but it was definitely there for at least a moment or two. After that night, I basically let my little brother take over my room while I slept on the couch. This went on night after night until my mom said she took care of it. We then let it go. Thinking back on it now, I'll ask her about that. Maybe there's another story in there somewhere. So did our two-year-old daughter glitch, or am I just living in her origin story? So I actually have two glitches which involve her. Naturally, I'm starting with the first, and then I'll get on to the second. The first glitch. This happened about eight weeks ago. It was past bedtime, and I could hear her, my daughter, awake in her bedroom, which she shares with her four-year-old brother. This isn't unusual, and they're really cute when they play and chat at night, so no big deal, right? I walked up the stairs, and I could hear their little chatting and giggles, so I decided to pop in and see if they needed anything and remind them it's sleep time. I stepped over the safety gate, so I was inside their bedroom, but only about one step inside. The hall light was on, and it lit up their bedroom. My son is in the left bed. My daughter is in the right. I say something like, What are you two up to? And they sheepishly tell me they're playing. My eyes adjust, and I can see my son in his bed, and my daughter in hers. I can see them moving and getting comfortable as we chat. The light is low, but enough to see the shapes of them, the reflection in their eyes, and their bedroom floor which is a narrow gap between their beds. We chat for about three minutes, and I ask them if they need anything. I clearly hear my daughter's voice answering me from her bed. As we're talking, I feel something brush the back of my leg. I didn't even look to check because we have cats, and those little devils follow me everywhere. One must have jumped over the safety gate and was coming to see if anything interesting was going on. Something felt a bit weird, though, and after maybe five seconds, I realized I hadn't heard the gate rattle. It always does that when a cat jumps over it. Ah, the cheeky little fur demon must have snuck in when I put them to bed, and it's probably why the kids are awake and giggling. I turned, and I looked at the small gap behind me, expecting to see a little black cat. And I shit you not, 
my two-year-old daughter is standing there. I was so shocked, I said to her, How did you get there? And that little girl just starts giggling her little butt off. Like, hysterically giggling. I start nervously laughing. I say, You were just in bed. Did you just teleport, little miss? And we all start laughing. I'm persistent and I ask a few more times, How did you get behind me? But she doesn't answer me. Just keeps giggling sweetly. I ask her brother, How does she do that? And he just carries on laughing. I even say, What's going on here? What are we all laughing about? But neither can answer. And I'm baffled. After a minute or two, I say something like, All right, super baby, let's get you back to bed. I tuck them back in, I close the door behind me. Totally freaked out, but not scared or anything. Just confusion. I feel like I just looked up and the sky was green. Now, I'd been looking at her, in bed. I was talking to her. I could hear her voice coming from her bed. I didn't see her get out of bed. I didn't see her walk towards me, down the thin strip of floor space. I didn't hear her footsteps on the floor. She didn't make a peep of noise. It was like she just appeared. I told my partner, and together we tried to figure it out. But it felt like something impossible had happened. Eventually, he just said, Glitch? And here I am. The second one, this happened not long after the first event, maybe 10 or 20 days later. It was close enough that the moment it happened, I instantly thought, not again, in a kind of acceptance way. It was long past bedtime for them, probably just after midnight. They'd gone to bed on time and I hadn't heard a peep from them. I let my dog into the back garden to do her thing and I started walking down my garden to a chair that we have on the far end. It was dark by this time, but the moon was out, so I could see well enough. I got halfway down the garden and turned to look at my house, instinctively looked up at their window. The light of the moon was hitting the window in a way which made the glass look kind of white, even though their blinds were closed. But I didn't just see the blinds in the window. I saw my daughter's silhouette standing on the windowsill. I can remember it as clearly as anything, like a flashbulb memory. It was a completely black silhouette, her size and shape, hands up to the glass. I couldn't make out any details or features. I recognized it was my daughter because of the size, but... At this point, I just knew there was a kid up in the window, and I ran like shit upstairs. I rushed into their room and flicked the main light on straight away. I'd already started talking and blurted out a word like, Hey, about to ask her what on earth she was doing. But I stopped in my tracks. Both the kids are in their beds. I figured she jumped down quickly and was pretending to be asleep. I actually walk up to her and try talking again, but this kid is fast asleep. If you've ever seen a young child in a deep sleep, it isn't something they can fake. Slightly sweating, pink cheeks, sprawled out like a dead weight. I'm so shocked now, because I'm so certain of what I saw. I checked my son, even though I knew it couldn't logically be him, but he was sleeping deeply, too. I just back out of their room, feeling pretty flabbergasted. This time, I definitely got creeped out a bit, along with the familiar confusion and disbelief. I went back outside and checked. The window was lit up the exact same way, only no weird toddler figure looking at me. Well, 
friends. It appears we've reached the end of tonight's episode, but be sure to join me every Friday night for a brand new one. I want to thank those who shared their stories, and a big thanks to all of you for listening. And also, thank you again to Booze and Booze for lending his talents to this episode. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to The Darkest Hour, and tap the bell so you never miss a thing. I sure do appreciate all of it, and I can't thank you enough. Huge shout out to all of my patrons for their unwavering support. Miss Anthropia, Shane Q, Monica L, The Dark Cosmos, Zoe Watt, Shelly B, Donald C, Rat Girl, Alicia S, and Aaron G. If you want to support The Darkest Hour in other ways, consider joining my Patreon. Patreon.com slash The Darkest Hour. Keep up with me and all things Darkest Hour over on my Instagram at The Darkest Hour YT or follow me on Twitter, Amanda Jane TDH. Do you have stories like these? I'd love to share them. Send them to me, Amanda Darkest Hour at gmail.com or on the Darkest Hour subreddit, The Darkest Hour YT. Stay spooky.